Here we go. You could, you could wait. Brooke for, Eby, everyone. You could wait for after me to record. <laughs> let's, let's, uh, I don't think we want this on the books. No, um, no, it's all good. I'm, I'm honored to open this up because when I saw the list of people speaking today, I think I was the only one without like letters after my name. Everyone was like MD, PhD. Mine was just like <laughs> Brooke Eby posts on social media. Um, but it's it's great to see you all. Um, most of you, I think, have heard my story, so hopefully it won't be too boring for all of you. I'll try to add in some spice. But for those who haven't, um, my story really starts in 2018, I would say, really 2017, although I tend to skip that part um, because I have ulcerative colitis, which is I mean, not something I usually talk about too much on these types of talks, but in 2017, I had a really, really bad flare up, um, really like was not able to eat super well, just like was not maintaining any nutrients. And I was put on prednisone, which, you know, they want you on it for four to six weeks usually. I mean, most of the, I'm, I'm watching Merit nod and I think that's the right time frame. I had to stay on them for a year because every time I would try to wean off of them, my stomach would just act up again. And I just was not, not doing well. Um, and so it really wasn't until beginning of 2018, a year later that I was able to start weaning off of them. And as I was, my body started growing back. Like I had lost probably 30 pounds. I started gaining the weight back, but my left calf stayed skinny. And I just thought, that's weird. I, I thought maybe it was, you know, just a, a slower limb to grow back. Um, and then I started noticing my calf felt tight, but again, just thought maybe I needed to stretch. I didn't know what was going on. Uh, and it really wasn't until like midway through 2018 that one of my colleagues pointed out that I was limping and I figured I worked out too hard. I was, you know, 29 at the time. And other than the ulcerative colitis flare was pretty healthy. Um, so didn't give it too much thought until I went to my sister and her husband who are both doctors. And I was like, I've been limping for, you know, a few months now, something's not quite right. And I'm sure most of you know this test, but they had me walk on my heels, walk forward. And my right heel was able to stay up, but my left foot just slapped down. And they were like, that is foot drop. You need to get that checked out. Of course, as most of you know, the first one I went to, I think was just like an orthopedic doctor, maybe like a surgeon, maybe my general doctor. I, I went, you know, anywhere but neurology. I figured I pinched a nerve in my back. It was affecting my foot. Um, and that kind of kicked off really a four-year diagnosis process for me. So I went to every type of doctor. Um, had really, in my mind, every test you can have, um, CAT scans, MRIs, x-rays. I did have an EMG uh, probably a year in, and it showed denervation in my left foot, but every other limb of mine was clear. It was a clean EMG other than the left foot. So ALS was brought up, but quickly crossed off because they were like, look, you've been having this limb for a couple of years now. It would have progressed. You're young. You don't have any family history. Like, we probably don't have to worry too much about this. Um, hindsight's 2020, right? Like, all of those things are not necessarily uh, binary, yes or no's for ALS. But after a couple more years, really four years into my limp, I started noticing that my balance was failing a little bit. And so I went back in, got another EMG, probably like my seventh or eighth EMG. Like to me, those tests are the worst tests that I, I had in all of the four years, but um, it finally showed denervation in my right foot as well. So that was when they, you know, they first called it a progressive motor neuron disease. But when you Google that, you can figure out pretty quickly what that probably is. And I got passed to an ALS clinic who, you know, a couple months later confirmed this is looking like ALS. So that was the beginning of last year. Um, so I never know when people say like, how long have you had it? Like I've had the diagnosis for a year and a half. I've had symptoms for five years. Um, so maybe I should just average the two, but 
the first couple months after my diagnosis were pretty rough. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of neurologists on here. So I, I know the, the fear of telling someone they have ALS has to be pretty high. And those first couple months as a patient after the fact, they stink. I was just trying to distract my brain as much as I could. I think I read like a book a day. I looked at my Goodreads the other day, last year, I read 80 some 82 books, I think. This year I'm at like 25. So you can tell I'm doing better. <laughs> But those first couple of months, it was just distractions. Um, and then I went to a wedding where I was using a walker a couple of months in and my friends just totally rallied around me. Like the bride was limboing under my walker and I was giving people walker rides and I was like, okay, we, we can still have fun with this, even though it's such, you know, a terrible label to have thrown on you. Um, and since then I, I've just been sharing my story with social media. I downloaded TikTok right away and just started doing some silly posts about like funny things that had happened to me since being diagnosed. People asking me on the street, like what was going on and just my weird responses out of panic. Um, funny things my family and my nieces have said to me, dating with ALS, like the, the comedy writes itself with an ALS diagnosis at the age of 33. And that's kind of been my last year and a half is just sharing my story and and trying to bring a face to this disease that I don't think people associate with ALS. Like a lot of people picture, you know, maybe a grandparent that they had, or maybe they picture Stephen Hawking or Lou Gehrig, but I feel like even those names are becoming like older and older in this next generation. They need a face to hang on to. And so I'm I'm trying to show people that ALS doesn't discriminate. It can affect anyone, any age, any time. You don't need family history. Um, you can be in your 20s living a fairly normal life and it can just come out of the blue. So that's sort of been my mission and uh, it's picked up a lot of traction. Luckily, we've grown quite a community through social media and through Salesforce where I work. We've been able to partner with ALS One quite a bit and drive a lot of fundraising there. So I'm grateful to be part of the ALS One family. And uh, if anyone has questions, I'm I'm an oversharer. If you've watched my social media, you know. So feel free to ask any questions. Um, but I will stop rambling and go on to the experts here. And I think I am passing to Dr. James Barry, who I got to meet in Boston just a couple of weeks ago. So I feel like we are long lost friends. Yeah, that was wonderful. It was really nice to get that chance to meet you in person. You too. And thank you for that incredible, um, you know, introduction to the day and for your amazing glasses. <laughs> I love okay, wait, those this glasses. is I'm so glad you this is my first day wearing them and I'm feeling really self-conscious. Like yeah, as I was talking, cool. I was distracted by them. So I appreciate it, James. Yeah. Well, thank you. I love that. <laughs> All right. So uh, and thank you to everybody for for being here today. I, I think um, you know, look, um Brooke's introduction sets us on a course to really talk about this disease and how we can come to diagnoses faster and then how we can have more and more to offer people once we do come to a diagnosis. And, um, you know, just to be able to say that we're making progress on those things and that our speakers today are the people who are making these things happen, publishing on it, bringing drugs to market, um, you know, guiding us through that research is incredibly exciting.